is so bad. I can see everybody. Good evening. My name is Bella Lapp, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We hereby recognize the prior status and enduring diversity of this land and the many indigenous nations that stand in relation to it, particularly the thousands of indigenous children from dozens of tribes forced into the reprogramming camp established at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, starting in 1879. Dickinson College supported this agenda of cultural eradication in both word and deed. Turning honestly toward that shameful past animates this acknowledgement and gives orientation to our desire for a reconciled future. Accordingly, this living land acknowledgement is intentionally incomplete a reflection of the ongoing process it represents, to learn respectfully from the stories of this land and the peoples that carry them, to think reflectively about the injustice of our shared past, and to act responsibly with that knowledge today to inspire a more equitable tomorrow. On behalf of the Clark Forum, Dickinson's first year seminar program, the departments of classical studies, Spanish and Portuguese studies, Africana studies, and educational studies, and the Latin American, Latinx, and Caribbean studies programs, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, Bodega mm -hmm. Poetics, Classics and the Caribbean Diaspora. Before I was assigned this event, my understanding of classical studies was limited to brief high school ancient history lessons and the Odyssey. I wondered why we value certain classical thinkers. Who decides what is considered classic and what occurred beforehand to make the creation of each classic piece of art, literature, or architecture possible. I started my research with Professor Padilla Peralta's autobiography, Undocumented, a Dominican boy's odyssey from a homeless shelter to the Ivy League. It was captivating, insightful, and funny. I found myself constantly smiling at his childhood stories. I was hooked immediately. As I got to know Professor Padilla Peralta through this book, I understood why classics resonated with him, and I began to wonder if all of our lives can be mapped within individual odysseys. This semester, I'm taking a class called The Literature of Migration and Displacement with Professor Menon. One of our first assigned readings was the introductory chapter of Kevin Kenney's Diaspora, a very short introduction. I began to understand that diaspora is not a fixed term. It is a gratifying way to acknowledge the complexity of the cross-continental web of relationships and new social contexts created by a diasporic spread of people. Understanding diaspora means understanding the transfer of knowledge and cultures, which includes individual odysseys like undocumented. Danelle Padilla Peralta is currently an associate professor of classics at Princeton University where he is involved in the departments of African-American studies, Latino studies, and Latin American studies. 
He is also affiliated with Princeton's University Center for Human Values. Professor Padilla Peralta is the author of two books, the first being Undocumented, A Dominica Boy's Odyssey from a Homeless Shelter to the Ivy League, and D Divine Institutions, Religions and Community in the Middle Republic. He is currently working on a third book provisionally titled Classicisms and Other Phobias. On the back of this evening's program, you will find a QR code. We would appreciate if you would complete the survey and provide feedback on how you find out about Clark Forum events. There will be a question and answer session immediately following tonight's program, so please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion, expressed politely, thoughtfully, and succinctly. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speaker, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect for our speaker and for everyone in attendance, please stay for the entirety of the program, including the question and answer um, session. Excuse me. There will also be a book sale and signing following tonight's event in the Stern Lobby. In the event of an emergency, note that accessible exits can be found through the double doors behind you and down the right hallway. The emergency exit will then be to your left. At this time, I ask that you all silence cell phones and electronic devices. And now, please welcome Professor Dan Alpadilla Peralta. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I want to start by expressing my gratitude for Bella for what was an outstanding introduction in every sense. I will later in the talk dwell on one of the points bearing directly on the living land acknowledgement, and specifically it summons to in, I, I think critically about the imbrication and interrelatedness of our forms of knowledge production with forms of exploitation past and present, and crucially, the structuring and imperializing devices of indigenous dispossession that have made institutions like Dickinson uh, a feature of our educational and national landscapes. But I also want to thank Bella and in, in fact thank uh, the Clark Forum community uh, and all of you um, for inviting me to spend time with you uh, and entertaining this project that I will lay out for you all. Not least because in this project, I try to think about a future that extends well past the types of classicism uh, within which I was trained um, and socialized um, to a horizon of possibilities um, for what constitutes the classical and what um, can be made ever more capacious and inclusive about the process of classicism that may hold out uh, a generative uh, prospect, a more meaningfully edifying prospect. And it is for that reason that I'm grateful, too, for the generosity of Bella's characterization um, of her experience of reading the memoir uh, and the questions it seeded um, uh, as she went through it. I begin uh, with a land acknowledgement of my own. Uh, I recognize my status um, as a resident on, as an employee of an institution that sits on, Lenny Lenape and Munsi Lands. Um, and with that statement, uh, I acknowledge simultaneously two things at once. First, my own implicatedness in the long arc uh, of indigenous dispossession. And second, my commitment uh, to the redistribution of material resources, foremost among them the land itself, that will be necessary for any equitable future to actually materialize. My talk today develops from a book project. It is in conversation uh, with the book manuscript in progress um, that, that Bella mentioned a moment ago, Classicisms and Other Phobias. But it also draws into its ambit uh, a longer term undertaking that investigates racialization in uh, the Caribbean and specifically the interface of racialization and the study of Greco-Roman antiquity in the Dominican Republic uh, from the long, across the long arc of its history uh, from the colonial period to the 21st century. As I understand it, any project of this kind has several obligations to shoulder. One of the most pressing obligations uh, is to clarify for anyone who seeks to engage with this project why such a project should matter 
in the first place. And I hope that by the end of tonight's talk, it'll become clear why an undertaking of this kind should matter. Many moons before the appearance uh, of the podcast uh, that inspired uh, this talk's title and conception, a seven-year-old boy stood for a photo in front of a Bronx bodega in 1991, striving his best to look tigere in a block in a neighborhood alive with other Dominican tigres. Right? And if you had approached me at the moment that this photo was snapped, a year and a half after my family's arrival in the United States, and asked me to propose a connection between the institution of the bodega and the study of Greco-Roman antiquity, I would have looked at you sideways because I know about that vinyl, right? So even though some forms of tigeraje were already familiar to me, I did not then have the gift of gab to spin a story about the field of study that is valorized and mystified in Euro-American settings as the classics, let alone to process a connection between that specific constellation of historically white centering power, the neighborhood bodega, and the Dominican American diaspora. Pathways for tracing the connections between the worlds of the bodega and the study of the ancient Greeks and Romans came into view a few years after that photo was snapped. For the entire 1993-1994 school year, my immigrant undocumented family was under the care of the New York City Department of Homeless Services. We entered the system through the Emergency Relocation Center in the South Bronx after having been evicted from our apartment in Queens, splitting my fourth grade year between one shelter in Chinatown, New York City, and another in Bushwick, Brooklyn. It was a punishingly lonely year and an experience made still more alienating by the shelter system's curfew rules. The evenings were busy with homework and dead time. We didn't have a TV for most of our time in the shelter, and I didn't have video games, the main entertainment of my school classmates, to occupy the hours. But fortunately for me, the first shelter came outfitted with a library on whose shelves sat a book entitled How People Lived in Ancient Greece and Rome. What was interesting in retrospect about my discovery of this book which centered the study of ancient Greece and Rome, was my obsession at the time with the history of the Caribbean and specifically the history of the Dominican Republic, where I had been born. But in a story often told in other contexts, but still all too easy uh, to sideline, there were no books about the Dominican Republic in the shelter's library, or for that matter, in any of the libraries that my mom took me to. This book on the Greeks and Romans that came to me at a time when I was experiencing what some philosophers of epistemology, foremost among them Miranda Fricker, whom I quoted on this slide, would call a hermeneutic deficit, played a vital role both in shaping and constraining my imagination. At the time, I was on the hunt for resources that could help me better explain my own background, my family's background, and the cultural context and political circumstances that had shaped it. Into that void of desire, there stepped not a direct response to my felt needs for explanation, but a vehicle of intermediation that steered towards the study of ancient Greece and Rome as one place where I should look for answers. The opening sentences of this book have remained with me ever since, and it wouldn't be an exaggeration to state that much of my academic career has evolved in tension with an unconscious critique of these sentences. Western civilization, the book declares rather pompously, was formed from the union of early Greek wisdom and the highly organized legal minds of early Rome. Mm. The belief in a person's ability to use his powers of reason, coupled with Roman faith in military strength, produced a result that has come to us as a legacy or gift from the past. This legacy has grown and blossomed into a smooth, colorful way of life covering equally the arts and the sciences, the one and the many. Difficult for me to comprehend in the instant of first encounter, and even more difficult to stomach in the years that followed, was the sharp contrast between this rhetoric of an optimistic and upbeat legacy, and those structural violences that were already leaving their imprint on my own sense of being in the world. On the initial read, 
I couldn't really appreciate what the demand to embrace this innocent seeming legacy as a smooth, colorful way of life would entail. Another aspect of my precipitation into the study of this curious gift would only become clearer many years later as I worked to learn more about those histories that had been and continued to be withheld from me as a preteen and teenager. And it is to a Caribbean diasporic fellow traveler in classics that I owe this aspect's most pointed distillation. Also appearing on this slide is a quotation from an essay by the classicist Sasha May Eccleston. Quote, there is no shame in admitting that the way we have entrained, the skills we have learned to complete projects recognizable within our disciplines may not empower us to do the work that emancipatory projects demand. We may well have to unlearn those skills and instead learn from those excluded by the framing of our disciplines and the gates of our institutions." End quote. In thinking through the demands of Eccleston's exhortation, I've tried to identify strategies for managing what Ruth Ann Kim, Anne Cahill, and Melissa Jacquard have termed the ontological labor of living and working within a predominantly white academy and a predominantly white discipline, all while holding on tenaciously to my diasporic moorings. This labor of identification has required me both to deconstruct the appearances of classics at formative stages in my life and to scrutinize ever more carefully the diasporic settings in which these appearances took place. Ideally, what I hope emerges from this labor is not just an offering to the field of classics that ranges well beyond the rose-tinted effusions of how people lived in ancient Greece and Rome, but a provocation to diasporic studies too, a resource for revisioning the maps of relationality that provides an additional, a supplemental cartography of diasporic states of being in their terrestrial and oceanic lifespans across the Black Atlantic. And so to that end, I circle back to the bodega in a bid to join forces with recent publications that make a home in the expansiveness of diasporic imaginaries. Today, I will insist explicitly on the bodega's generativity for a historical poetics. And the ultimate hope is to tease out of the bodega's contingent cultural and social meshwork a linkage between antiquities and modernities, between the Greco-Roman Mediterranean and the Black Aegean of the Greater Caribbean Sea. What I discovered in high school, had reason to regard critically in college, and eventually found myself in the position to teach in classes, is that the word bodega's origins reached through Latin to ancient Greek. While bodega in Spanish originally means wine shop or cellar, its specific meaning in a New York City and Northeast Atlantic context crystallizes during several waves of 20th century Puerto Rican emigration, as many of you will know. But the Spanish word is derived from Latin apotheca, which in turn is a borrowing from Greek apotheke, a depot or store. Bodega is thus etymological kin with words like boutique and apothecary, which likewise hail from the same root. To be sure, at the time of my inaugural etymological adventure in the lands of Bodega, I wasn't prepared to grasp properly the significance of this move to etymology as a stratagem for pinning down necessarily elusive origins, or to recognize that the chase for origins is always fraught with ideological baggage. The complexity of moves to etymology and of those feats of lexicography upon which these moves rest can, in its own way, be challenging to apprehend. Dictionaries themselves emerge from imperializing formations of power that require tools of contextualization and analysis. These formations of power impinge on the bodega's history as an institution. Those of us accustomed to spending time in bodegas are primed to imagine them as a node for resale, redistribution, and immigrant sociality. But a deeper history that one can tell about the bodega extends beyond the migratory and economic flows of the 20th and 21st centuries to the long durée of commercial exploitation and commodity production in ancient Western Eurasia and in the era of the Roman Mediterranean. This history binds the Iberian Peninsula, already in the era of the Roman conquest in the final few centuries BCE, and then for centuries after the Roman conquest, to regimes of settler colonialist agricultural exploitation that were governed by what the historians Peregrine Horden and Nicholas Purcell 
have perceptively characterized as, quote, imperatives of survival, diversify, store, redistribute, end quote. In the Roman period, the labor through which these imperatives uh, were, was, was met regularly fell and brutally on the shoulders of enslaved persons. It is the history of slavery in the ancient Mediterranean that supplies the backdrop for those systems of storage and warehousing, an entire matrix of economic production through which Apotheke travels on its way to becoming bodega. To fix the meanings of the bodega for my own diasporic identity, one taking shape around an ever-widening scholarly commitment to Greco-Roman antiquities and Afro-Caribbean classicisms, I had to immerse myself in forms of re- and co-education. As I developed the skills to practice the profession of classics, I had also to develop other techniques for seeing beyond the bounds of the narrow, triumphalist classicism that was curated for me in books such as How People Lived in Ancient Greece and Rome. That training required fluency in the diasporic histories of the Caribbean and their transmediation of ancient Greece and Rome in forms that may be colorful but are hardly smooth. One of these histories can be plotted by direct reference to the institution from which I received my undergraduate degree and of which I am now an employee, and that is Princeton. Prior to entering state and national politics, Woodrow Wilson was president of Princeton University, which was his undergraduate alma mater, from 1902 to 1910. Still the recipient of veneration in some circles, uh, Wilson was directly responsible for the perpetration of racist violence, not only in the United States, uh, but beyond its borders. In his hands, the Monroe Doctrine practices of paternalistic oversight and aggressive intervention, which had been already retooled in the course of the transition into Teddy Roosevelt's presidency, assumed new and even more vigorous life. To quote Wilson himself, if we have been obliged by circumstances in the past to take territory which we otherwise would not have thought of taking, I believe I am right in saying that we have considered it our duty to administer that territory, not for ourselves, but for the people living in it, end quote. For our time together today, one aspect of this Wilsonian discourse and its materialization during and after his presidency is uniquely relevant. Interventions in the Caribbean ostensibly to protect Caribbean communities from European predations were both economic and military in nature. Under Wilson, the United States occupied Haiti in 1915 and the Dominican Republic the following year. The Dominican writers and artists who came to populate the spaces of Gloria Garcia Peña's El Nie, discussed in her book, The Borders of Dominicanidad, were exceptionally well positioned to dissect the aftershocks of these Caribbean interventions. In their practice of dissection, pursued and imagined from an assortment of diasporic states, we see a diasporic poetic slowly gaining momentum. In the decades that saw a first US intervention set the stage for one dictatorship, and then, after the assassination of Rafael Leonidas Trujillo in 1961, a quasi-dictatorship that masked itself in the genteel intellectualism of Joaquin Balaguer. What this diasporic poetics exhibits is a commitment to thinking with Greco-Roman antiquity as a cornerstone of its efforts to critique the modern dispensations of the Dominican state and of the geopolitics that had snared it. The well-traveled Aida Cartagena Porta Latin illustrates some of the literary maneuvers that came to be patterned to the rhythms of diasporic existence in conversation with Greco-Roman antiquity in her 1970 novel, Escalera para Electra, Staircase for Electra. The novel's protagonist, Helen, Elene, is a Dominican woman who cannot shake memories of her childhood friend Swain while crisscrossing modern Athens on foot. Although Swain's family history is the stuff of Greek tragedy uh, with incest and multi-generational trauma looming, looming especially large, the novel's most explicit recourse to classical Greece is articulated in diasporic space and in the context of a reflection on contemporary geopolitics. Deep in conversation with another friend on the topic of US military interventions in the Dominican Republic, Elena remarks, I'll read in Spanish, the English is on this slide, 
en Dominicana, desde que, desde que los gringos pisotearon por primera vez la soberanía nacional, a los patriotas que defienden su tierra, sus minas y sus cosechas, los llaman bandoleros o gavilleros. Es así, señor Majuar. En la Dominicana, como en la antigua Esparta, se imponen tiranías con el respaldo militar. A ese engaño lo llaman democracia. To this deceit they give the name of democracy. It's not accidental that Elena's comparison of the Dominican Republic to ancient Sparta occurs in a conversation held outside of our homeland, but about U.S. geopolitics affecting our homeland. The more obvious reading of this simile is that military interventions have unintended consequences. Much as classical Sparta's interventions to bring down tyrannies often backfired, so too did modern American interventions in the Dominican Republic enable and backstop new forms of oppression. But the simile's subtext is that those who are propelled into diasporic flight because of these military interventions and are subsequently burdened with making sense of those geopolitical forces that sent them in migrant orbit productively braid together the near past of diaspora and the more distant past of antiquity. Elena Simile thus leverages the classical past for a critique of the authoritarian present that is figured as hailing from the diasporic margins. The mediating force of ancient history as a site that is artfully crafted in diaspora comes fully to the fore here. The similarly itinerant poet and journalist Pedro Mir charts a complementary path to the recovery and representation of diasporic vertigo in the opening verses of his Contracanto a Walt Whitman, countersong to Walt Whitman. I, a son of the Caribbean, yo, un hijo del Caribe, precisamente antillano, Antillean to be exact, producto primitivo de una ingenua criatura borinqueña, de un obrero cubano, nacido justamente y pobremente in suelo quisqueyano, the raw product of a simple Puerto Rican girl and a Cuban worker born precisely and poor on Quisqueyan soil. In the hands of an artist who, in life and poetic persona, shuttled around the Western Hemisphere, Dominican identity, as formulated in direct dialogue with one of the iconic representatives of muscularly nationalist North American verse, Whitman, emerges from the fusion of already constituted Caribbean constructs the Puerto Rican woman, the Cuban worker. These opening lines punningly disclose other origin stories too. The ingenua nods to the ingenio, the sugar plant that refined the producto primitivo, the raw product of the cane fields, into a commodity for circulation and consumption. Even more important than the facts of biography, Mir's obrero cubano father actually had come over to the Dominican Republic as chief of engineers for a sugar refinery, is the status of sugar as the commodity that wires Mir's production of Caribbean diasporic identities to what Kyla Wazana Tompkins in a highly nimble reading of Sydney Mintz specifies as, quote, the affective capacity of what we have come to call racism that derives its force from the lives and afterlives of sugar agriculture and its enslaved labor extraction, end quote. Sugar's centrality to the exploitation of Kiskeyan communities at U.S. hands has been extensively documented, and I will come back to sweetness as a principle for diasporic poetics in a few minutes. In recent publications, I've tried to work through two different vectors of diasporic identity as it fragments and reassembles amidst the cunning moves of empire and its afterlives. These vectors are, respectively, the nesological and the epistemicidal. With the first term, which is a neologism for the study of islands that I borrowed from Antonis Balasopoulos, I designate the inquiry into those processes by which migrants on the move are buffeted and accosted from point A to B to C on the arc of mobility. And I zero in particularly on the historical and contemporary magnetism of islands as sites for the determination of admissibility to the polity and of admissibility to citizenship. This historical dynamic seems to me to warrant an engagement with citizenship that probes its discursive production of insularity, its capacity to turn communities into islands, 
as the purposing of islands into carceral pens for the forcibly displaced continues to make regular headlines. From Manus Island to Winston, shown as the island, the migrant and refugee regularly face a cyclopean terror, not only the denial and destruction of homecoming, the achingly sought nostos of the Homeric Odysseus, but the prospect of never-ending repetition, of always having to hop from one island to the next. But what's going to concern me for the rest of this talk is what I designated earlier as the epistemicidal. And I'm going to give a definition of epistemicide in a moment, but to give you an exemplification of this process and its relationship to the diasporic vertigos of translation of interest to me, I want to turn to another poem. This is a poem entitled Areito por Todos, Ritual Song for Us All. And it's the work of a contemporary Dominican-American poet, Cesar Sanchez Beras. His fellow Dominican-American poet, Rina Espaillat, recently chose Beras' poem for inclusion in the Library of Congress Poetry of America series. Here's how it goes. Me sacaron como apache de la llanura y del viento, me arrojaron como inca de la barca del silencio, pero vengo de la sombra, del pasado y del futuro. Me sacaron como indio, pero vuelvo como negro. Me sacaron como negro del tambor de la esperanza, me negaron el trapiche para moler mis adentros, me negaron en Yoruba, en Bantú, Carabalí, pero vuelvo en la manigua, cimarrón en blanco y negro. Me sacaron por judío, por latino, por moreno. Me sacaron por hispano, por guloya y por negrero. Me sacaron de las nubes donde desnudé la lluvia. Me sacaron de los montes donde desnudé la tierra. Pero vuelvo como indio, pero vuelvo como negro. Pero vuelvo en español, en yoruba, en taíno. Regresando por los montes, estrenando un rostro nuevo. Vengo con el mascarón de los que no tienen patria. Me sacaron, me sacaron. Pero vuelvo, pero vuelvo. With the title of this poem, Beras gestures to traditions of indigenous and native song whose documentation in the decades after the first contact opened up already then a matrix of relations very much in line with my paper's project of bridging between Greco-Roman antiquities and modernities. For the 16th century French jurist Francois Baudouin, it was perfectly sensible and indeed alluring to place the tradition of the Caribbean areto alongside the Carmena Conguiwalia of the Romans and the historical songs of, the, of Tacitus's Germans. For present purposes, though, I want to fasten on to Espaillat's interpretation of Beras's poem, a poem that she reads as an encomium to the indefatigability and indomitability of the forcibly displaced. Not only native indigenous communities uprooted by settler colonialism or Africans set in violent marine motion by the transatlantic slave trade, but the Jews and Moors whose expulsions are implicated in the formation of the early modern North Atlantic are never gone for long in the logic of this poem. They always return in another's guise. Espaillat, in her translation, of me sacaron as they tossed me away, nicely flavors Beras's poem with a reminiscence of the Roman poet Virgil's Yactatus through which one strand of ancient Mediterranean epic located a community's birth in the storm-tossed journey of the forcibly displaced. There's something reassuringly strong and seemingly timeless, classicized even, about the promise of return rooted in the repetitive tenacity of Pero Vuelvo. Yet there's another and bleaker uh, aspect to this insistence. The poem simultaneously foregrounds empire's zest for a racial and ethnic interpolation. They toss me away as Apache, they toss me away as black, etc. And it's scrambling of racial and ethnic assignments. The first person voice announces their triumphantly pluripotent return in Spanish, in Yoruba, and in Taino, wearing the mask of those who have no country. In the quiet and steady resolve of return, the distinct and differentiable identities that emerge and are policed under the sign of empire, 
no longer, according to the logic of the poem, matter as much. They are tossed away as the first person of Vengo and Vuelvo asserts itself. That first person voice in the poem professes to wear, quote, the mask of those who have no country, unquote. But by the mere fact of doing so, it does not recover or reanimate the lost. Instead, it simply ventriloquizes them. The poem is a performance script whose efficacy rests on the paired suppositions that the distinct historical traumas of settler colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade are, one, homologous, possibly even isomorphic, and two, equally tractable for recreation and reenactment. Meanwhile, the racial configurations that authorize and fuel these traumas exist only to be superseded in time by the figure of the survivor turned actor who can inhabit all of these configurations at once. They are rendered ever more malleable and plastic in an uplifting recoding of the more sinister discursive effacements of blackness who indigenismo in 20th and 21st century constructions of Dominican identity. And now we come to the beating heart of the dilemma that most interests me and that most motivated me in turning to this poem in the first place. The dilemma whose impingement on my own work as an ancient historian and as a classicist sours the poem's taste in my mouth. Where exactly are we to locate in historical time the figure who commands the full range of these historical traumas and shapes them into this performance of ceaseless return. On one generous reading, this figure is a hypostasis of the historian, of an ideal historian, uh, a historian who can't actually exist. He would be like a Borgesian Funes Memorioso. Um, and he can't actually exist because his existence would be more than merely mawkish. It would be kind of gross to imagine a historian capable of summoning and ventriloquizing all of these different voices. But the grotesquerie is rooted in a still more basic aspect um, of this poem's ventriloquism, which is that there is no historiographical document that is not at the same time a document of the destruction of cultural knowledges as a direct consequence of imperialism's ravages. Among the cornerstone principles of my ongoing research is the disciplinary connivance of Euro-American disciplinary formations, such as classics, with epistemicidal projects. In other contexts, I've tried to argue for a more reparative classics, a, a classics that embraces a robust confrontation with those human and cultural losses that defy easy delineation or quantification, but whose force reverberates throughout contemporary communities in the global north and south, not least among those Caribbean communities whose historical and cultural origins are linked to the reproduction of knowledge structures that have historically been staked to racialized classicism. This reparation, as I understand it, would entail simultaneously the redistribution of material resources, the reorientation of affects, and a far more expansive vision of what classicism as a process is and what it can accomplish. On this front, the poetry of the Caribbean diaspora is a richly enhancing resource, as the works of Rina Espaillat, whom we encountered earlier as an interpreter of Cesar Veras, herself disclose. A standout demonstration of her reorientation to the past and her encounter with historical ghosts appear in her collection, The Storyteller's Hour, uh, as poem number four in part two, five revisions respectfully suggested to our author. And I quote Espaillat. How the starved ear of conscience listens for this song. We are the shades of Auschwitz, of Buchenwald, Treblinka, here with our brothers and sisters from every age, the slavers' merchandise, the conquered and forgotten. We are here to still the cries of the living, you who disturb our sleep with the noise of your anguish for our sake. You are mistaken who grieve for us. Would our Father, who in the maze of night guides the least bird, permit us to be lost? We are not lost not ground beneath the wheels of some blind engine. We were summoned singly by name in love to the breast of our mother, to the refuge of our father's hand. So do they sing, but only to the ear of our desire as to a frightened child, the shades of Auschwitz, of Buchenwald, Treblinka. 
The proposition of affinity and kinship between the shades of Auschwitz, of Buchenwald, Treblinka, and our brothers and sisters from every age, the slaver's merchandise, the conquered and forgotten, is electrifying, at least on a first read. These lines by imagining the capacity of the shades to relate to other victims of destructive, genocidal, and epistemicidal violences across space and time, close the imaginative deficit that may prevent some readers from grasping, let alone fully internalizing, the premise that the Holocaust and the transatlantic slave trades and other forms of genocidal violence are bound in the same cosmic web. And besides insisting on their kinship with all the conquered and forgotten, these voices have no patience for the idea that they are lost, consigned to some aimless drift in the domains of oblivion. To quote the poem again, would our father, who in the maze of night guides the least bird, permit us to be lost? We are not lost, not ground beneath the wheels of some blind engine, end quote. There, this insistent plaint, framed around the image of the father, quote, who guides the least bird, end quote, finds the poem to others in Espaillat's collection that meditate variously on, to list the topics, King Herod and the slaughter of the innocents, the biblical flood with its rising wave personified into full awareness of, quote, the scurry of small things trapped in their grave, drowned in their burrows, end quote, and the dove of spirit who lingers over the, quote, poor sleeping maid, end quote, mulling whether to bruise this woman so sorrow in so fair a room, end quote. Within the space of ghostly presences opened up in each of Espaillat's poems, the prospect of historical counterfactual beckons, the Herod who rescinds his order at the last minute, the flood that recedes by mercy shamed away, the dove that vows no Calvary. What the counterfactual prospect, or at least the dialing back of tragedy to an instance of imagined deliberation in advance of a decision that could have unfolded otherwise, offers is a tentative investment in the possibility that history can be rewritten or perhaps even be redone in the service of a higher justice. At the same time, her verses model a poetics of care for the dead that mirrors and amplifies as Payas' responses to aging and mortality elsewhere in her poetry. The sensibility for care asserts itself powerfully in the poem that you see on this slide, but with a twist. The shades speak to assuage, quote, the cries of the living, you who disturb our sleep with the noise of your anguish for our sake, end quote. Out of the conviction that the grief of the living wrenching though it may be, is off the mark. The menace of annihilation has not collapsed the shades into one undifferentiated mass, but instead, quote, summon them singly by name, in love, end quote. With this line, the poem calculates its move towards the defiant rejection of the anxiety that the conquered and forgotten are shades without name. They are presumed and said to live in confidence and full control of their identities, even in the valley of death. Their election to the breast of our mother, to the refuge of our father's land, was not only specific, but by implication, purposeful, in no way the consequence of a polarizing, blind engine. The meaning of their relegation to the Hall of Shades resides all, above all, in this, that their lives responded ultimately to the direction of a providence that called them back home. Yet here comes the twist, prefigured in the poem's opening lines and sharpened at the end. It is the starved ear of conscience that conjures this song of the shades. The siren-like enchantment of consolation from the mouths of the dead turns out, on closer inspection, to have no existence independent from the ear of our desire as to a frightened child. The poem's framing device is thus structured around the deliberate ambiguity that plays with our desire to recreate the dead, but withholds any certain commitment to their reanimation as anything other than song or poetry. It is this generative ambiguity that returns me by ways both direct and indirect to the bodega, this time as the instantiation of a caretaking poetics on guard against the obliterative forces of empire. Here again I turn to Rina Espaillat, who offers plenty of food for thought in another poem in a collection entitled Lapsing to Grace. 
bitter coffee, musty beans, caramel and guava jam, rice and sausage, nippy cheese, saffron anise, honey ham, rosemary, oregano, clove, allspice, and bacalao. 50 years have blown away. Childhood falls around me now. Childhood in another place where the tang of orange sweets, golden on the vendor's tray, drifts like laughter through the streets. Memory is filament, weaving, weaving what I am. Bitter coffee, musty beans, caramel, and guava jam. The governing metaphor of the fourth and final stanza is memory is thread and identity is weft work. But the dominant theme of the, poems, of the poem's sprightly rhyme is food. It is a poem that recreates the bodega through its distinctive tastes and smells. Sensory memory reverses time. 50 years have blown away, as it grounds the poet in the immediately sensuous present. Over the for contemplation is the bodega's trans-temporality. While recollection of its food stocks activates the traffic between past and present, it's not implied that the bodega of the past has ceased to exist. On the contrary, in the final stanza's coupling of guava jam to I am, the poem foregrounds the bodega's continuing embodiment and the sugary savor of fruit. Here again, as we saw with Mir a few minutes ago, the crucial role of sugar in the conceptualization of one's place and the hemispheric web of relationships comes into view. See, in this light, the bodega's products are inseparable from the history of the Colombian exchanges that sets many of them in transcontinental motion in the first place. In this litany of artifacts whose origins reach back to that exchange, we are treated to a commodity inventory that travels on the same arc as the transatlantic slave trades and their afterlives. For me, the history of these items is on one level a concretely familial one. Bacalao frying for hours on end while uncles and aunts and cousins crowded into a Bronx apartment to dance bachata. And while a little boy, the same little boy you saw standing in that bodega at the start of the talk, awaited instructions to run down and get what needed to be gotten whenever it was time to restock. Sugared sweets and salted fish. This was simultaneously the flavorful pairing of our migratory convivial sustenance and the fraught inheritance of many centuries. Especially because of this inheritance, it's all the more appropriate to see the sweep of the diasporic state and of the poetics exemplified by Espaillat as extending beyond any one contingent patterning. It vibrates between past and present with a resonance and an echo that has been picked up in the work of historians of slavery, chief among them, the historian and literary critic, Sadia Hartman. Take the searing sequence from her 2007 book, Lose Your Mother, a journey along the, trend of the Atlantic slave route, as one instance of the capacity to leverage historiography of the slave trade, autoethnography, and autobiography as a point of departure for thinking about the extensive, eruptive sweep of the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade down into our very contemporary moment. I, too, Hartman writes, live in the time of slavery by which I mean I am living in the future created by it. It is the ongoing crisis of citizenship. Questions first posed in 1773 about the disparity between the sublime ideal of freedom and the facts of blackness are uncannily relevant today. The echoes could be heard in a plea, still waiting for an answer, chalked onto a rooftop in the ninth ward of New Orleans. Help, the water is rising, please. Six people are trapped on the roof and two of them are waving American flags, hoping against the odds that the stars and stripes might make their plight visible, keep them afloat, and demonstrate unequivocally, we are citizens too. But the anxiety and the doubt fueling the assertion was made plain by the photograph's caption, Castaway. History doesn't unfold with one era bound to and determining the next in an unbroken chain of causality. It is without providence or final cause, writes Foucault. There is only the iron hand of necessity shaking the dice box of chance." Unquote. So the point isn't the imp impossibility of escaping the stranglehold of the past, or that history is a succession of uninterrupted defeats, or that the virulence and tenacity of racism is inexorable, but rather that the perilous conditions of the present establish the link between our age and a previous one 
in which freedom too was yet to be realized. The past is neither inert nor given. The stories we tell about what happened then, the correspondences we discern between today and times past, and the ethical and political stakes of these stories redound in the present." End quote. Complementary to Hartman's exposition of the past's eruption into the present is the summons of the Haitian historian, Jean Casimir. While those intent on pursuing historical imagination in diasporic vertigo as a decolonial praxis, and for those seeking a prose complement to the poetics at the heart of my talk, there are few guides more acute and discerning. The Haitians, a decolonial history, opens with a luminous account of the relationship between Casimir's own ancestral past and his embodied practice of historiography. Quote, if readers ask what I have learned from writing this book that I now offer to them, my answer is that above all in how I live my personal life, I no longer see my ancestors as former slaves. I don't even think of them as a dominated class. Their misery is only the most superficial aspect of their reality. It is the reality that colonialists prefer to emphasize, along with those among them who oppose the cruelty of some colonists, but don't ultimately reject colonization itself. Having finished this book, I've come to realize that my ancestors, as individuals and as a group, never stopped resisting slavery and domination. I am the child of a collective of fighters, not of the vanquished. I have chosen to venerate them, to honor these captives reduced to slavery and those emancipated as a reward for their service to colonialism. I do so despite their errors and their occasional failures, end quote. I would add one thing to the list of choices Casimir makes. And it is that in looking at my own ancestors and in looking at their circulation in the vertigo of diaspor diasporic relations, I have chosen to classicize them. I've chosen to assign to them the status of classics that had previously been distributed to communities more distant in time and idealized as distant in time in the context of a white affirming discipline that emerges in the 19th and 20th centuries. In classicizing them, I act at the behest of several imperatives. The demands that, that fuse our diasporic presence to black Atlantic past carry special weight for those of us who, in the afterlives and ongoing crises of imperial violence, seek to hold ourselves accountable to our ancestors, flitting around, looking out for guava jam in bodega. To unshoal the shades as living beings who fought and died but who still roam among us, and to recognize them in their deaths as endowed with communicative force, is the first step to a poetics not of an absent or irrecoverable past, but of a present and future in which all the ghosts live with us. And the realization of the present and future a willfully transgressive and undisciplined bodega poetics holds great promise. The practice of imagining and roaming through that poetic space will be exacting. As Christina Sharp has demonstrated, it's not easy to live in the wake. But fortunately, there will be places to dip into for refreshment and sustenance. The bodega will always be stocked with jam. Thank you very much. Now we got to take questions. Yay! Yes, it is now time for the question and answer session. Because this event is being recorded, uh, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to reach you before asking your question. We reserve the first questions for students, and, we, and then we will open up to the rest of the audience. We will now take the first question. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, concerning your, your work with the redistribution of the classics, I wanted to know if you had any thoughts, positively or, uh, positive or negative, about the recent expansion of classical schools at a grade school level. Um, do you think that, this is, that a classically centered education is or can be appropriate for young people today? And how can you go about them in a way that um, that decolonizes the, the classics? 
just because I want you to put all your cards on the table in posing that question, uh, when you refer to a classically centered education with reference to these schools, what do you mean? Um, I mean a uh, classical, uh, an independent classical school. The, um, the genre of independent school that is focused uh, or that is anchored in classical uh, Greek and Latin languages and ancient Western cultures. Mm -hmm. What do you think they mean by classical? I mean, you're going to see why I'm asking these questions in a moment, but... Um, let's see. In the case of these schools, I think uh, something that's classical is... Something that's classical is a thing that transcends uh, cultures and, and time. When we think of something indisputably classical, um, the poems attributed to Homer, uh, we think of something that, for instance, we think of something that uh, no matter who you are, uh, where you're coming from in life, there is something that you can take from it and something that you, um, something by which you can, something in that work by which you can be improved. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is something which is classical. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't that be true of, say, Aida Cartagena Porta Latins Escalera para Electra? Why wouldn't that be true of, say, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Why wouldn't that be true of any of a myriad of texts? I, I don't think that, uh, I, I think that that would be true. All right. So now we get then to uh, the, 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 the core uh, of what my reservation is about these schools. Um, I would divide this reservation into two parts. Um, and I'm going to try not to dwell on each for too long, because if left to my own devices, I could gladly talk about this for an hour. <laughs> First, I charge uh, the, 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 the model behind uh, the dissemination of these curricula and those responsible for their dissemination with inattention to the actual machinery of classicism. Right? So my contention is that they actually do not have a substantive understanding of the historical processes by which the classical comes to be classical. Right? The second charge that I'll level, um, and one that follows from the first, is that their exaltation of a certain core of text as universalizable presupposes, by dint of exclusion, that there are many other texts that cannot make that claim. But they have no way of establishing the veracity of this claim. Right? So if, as y'all probably suspected, I, uh, I believe, you, you incline to a direction of understanding the classics and the production of classicism is bound up with processes of wealth distribution, racialization, imperialism, settler colonialism, then you, you need some kind of framework for relating the survival and reproduction of texts across time that attends quite insistently and quite rigorously to the interaction of that survival with some of these processes. And so at the core of my two-part reservation, active in defining both the terms of number one and the terms of number two, is my belief that there is insufficient attention devoted to the interface of material and historical processes with the constitution of the classical, right? Now, this does bring up another question, and it is one with which I genuinely struggle, because you know, it's, it's like kind of easy for me to um, uh, level this kind of charge. Um, but for me, the more interesting thing is, how would you go about teaching folks what I've just said, or what we've just been talking about for the past, you know, what, I, what I've been uh, propounding to you for the past 15 minutes or whatever? And I confess that I, I, I've had a great I've experienced a great deal of uncertainty in recent years um, about how best to do this um, for a couple of reasons. Um, so I'll single out a context in which this kind of work takes place outside of a university um, setting. So most summers, I'm involved in uh, the work of the Freedom and Citizenship Program, uh, which is based at Columbia, but um, works with high schoolers, um, particularly rising, uh, rising seniors, um, right after their junior year. And 
this program is set up in two parts. Uh, there, there's a three-week uh, intensive uh, summer seminar where uh, students read texts um, and engage in critical discussion of these texts. Um, and then there is a year-long uh, college guidance and civic engagement component. Right? Now, what is striking, um, given what I've just said to you about um, the reservations I hold about uh, projects like um, the, the, the Hillsdale paradigm, um, is that if you look at the selection of texts for this summer seminar, you'll see that it overlaps a great deal with Columbia's core curriculum, which is very much wedded to an idea that uh, there are some texts whose resonance is potentially universalizable and therefore have to feature in a kind of common uh, curricular dispensation. Right? So what happens in, in, in a setting like this is that inevitably I find myself engaging in a kind of counter, uh, counter teaching, right? So for instance, you know, we, we, we start by, you know, doing a week on several ancient Greek texts. Um, and then we move to early modern texts that take up, refract, and modulate aspects of those ancient Greek texts. And this all begins to seem a little linear. So I try to puncture this illusion of linearity, right? And I try also to draw attention to some of the more murderous dimensions of this early modern reception, right? So, for instance, when John Locke thinking through his own response to, among others, Hobbes' reading of ancient authors, imagines America as the space in which there is no government. In the beginning, all was America, making a claim that is very much anchored to uh, the articulation of a settler colonial logic. What exactly is at stake in that reception of ancient Greco-Roman paradigm? Right? Well, it's purpose to quite violent ends. I mean, we, we know this because Locke, among other things, is involved um, directly uh, in settler colonialism. But like teasing out this story, even for high schoolers, is like who are already far along in the game to sort of begin thinking along these lines, is actually kind of tricky, right? And it's tricky at the college level, it's tricky at the grad level. Like, I mean, like it's tricky at every single register of education, right? So for all that I, uh, chide uh, some of the efforts to present uh, a, what I see as, 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 a, as a brutally oversimplified and dangerously tendentious form uh, of the study of classics, uh, one that fails to take into consideration anything having to do uh, with race or racialization or settler colonialism. I also recognize that there is a responsibility on, on me and on those of us who are interested in this kind of work to develop forms of teaching that are commensurate to the task of actually inviting students into more sophisticated appraisals of this material, right? And that, that is like genuinely hard work. Mass. Um, so, what is your favorite autobiography? My favorite autobiography? Me too. I, so, when I was working on my memoir, I read loads of autobiographies because I realized I didn't know how to write. About, I didn't know how to write a memoir. I, I, I didn't know how to write, a, write about myself. Um, I will single out one that I enjoyed, but that was not, I, I don't think it, it holds a claim to being my absolute favorite because I find it very difficult to like rank order things like this. So I read this autobiography entitled The Tender Bar by J.R. Moringer. Um, and it came to me at a uniquely charged moment in my own reflection of, of, on what memoir could do um, because one of the issues that uh, is tackled in the tender bar is Moringer's own relationship with like an absent father presence and Moringer's relation uh, to, well, a bar and to drinking. Um, and as I thought about the relationships that had patterned my own life, it, it became clear to me that there was much I could draw on in this memoir um, about its evocation uh, of these sort of deficits of paternity, about the kinds of provisional, temporary, yet still incredibly powerful father figures that emerge in, in, in this kind of absence. But what I loved most about it, and the reason why I'm citing it as one that stuck with me, is that it is incredibly evocative of place. And I realized that this was actually very important to me. Um, that I wanted above all else, in my own writing, to conjure as richly layered a sense of place as I could. Um, 
And in subsequent readings of other memoirs, one of the things that I became most attentive to was how they, 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 they organized for the imagination of the reader a, a, a sense of place and time. And I, I encountered autobiographies that were exceptionally good at this even when I actively disliked their protagonist or the politics of the autobiographies themselves. So I'll name one that was instructive for me because it, it was presented to me by one of my editors as, a, uh, as an example of how to like organize like vignettes within autobiographical um, narratives. Um, this is uh, Losing My Cool by Thomas Chatterton Williams. Um, I mean, if I started talking about my profound dislike for Chatterton Williams politics, like this too could take me uh, well past um, our Q&A. Um, but there, there is something quite sophisticated um, about the, the patterning of space and time in the memoir. It's like very smooth. Like you have to like drill into the mechanics of the memoir to realize that there, there is something quite remarkable about how each story is made to speak to a particular configuration of space-time. Um, and like as someone who like had some flirtations with like literary criticism in college and afterwards, I was like, ooh, like I have like all these like Bakhtinian theories of like the chronotope that I could bring to bear on this. But like it, it was just like an, a, 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 an exquisite craft of memoir that stood out to me most of all. So I'm gonna name those two. Um, there are others, but I'll stop right there. Why did you ask? Well, that, that, is, that is kind. I'll have to generate a list for you uh, so that mine can then start moving down that list. So we're at the bottom of it. Hello, thank you so much for your talk today. So um, you've kind of uh, taken us through, uh, a, you know, a gallop through different ways where you can, you know, the classics and, you know, post-colonial criticism can interact, which is wonderful. Um, so, you know, something that we've kind of been talking about is that this, you know, what you talked about when you answered the first question about how this is kind of a, like a shared discourse that, that continues and that's kind of, <laughs> that, that's what the, I guess, uh, idea of the classics really is. Um, so I was wondering if, you know, af after all this, if, you know, it's, a shared discourse we should try to keep alive. Should we just add to it, like you said, to add things like Invisible Man? Or is it something that, like, are the core tenets of kind of that, that like, book you read in your childhood, obviously, you know, we, we tore it apart in a lot of ways, but uh, is some of that, is it, do you think it's salvageable, or do you think that it should be rewritten? Hmm. Well... On some days, you'll find me in a cheerier disposition about this than others. <laughs> so, I, in, in preparing this, um, this book manuscript for uh, entitled Classicisms and Other Phobias, I, I, I spent a lot of time in the early stages of the pandemic um, making full use of my institution's access to Hathitrust Trust to like, go through all of these like journals. Um, and I was conducting these uh, sweeping searches of them, um, mainly with a view to cataloging things that get talked about and don't get talked about, especially in um, classics journals, but also in classics adjacent journals too. And in one of these journals um, that existed mainly as an outlet for sort of off-the-cuff writing um, or sort of like preliminary writing to the drafting of an of um, actual formal article, this journal uh, entitled the Liverpool Classical Monthly. The editor at the time led one of the issues with some remarks on uh, defenses of the classics. And I have to read it um, because I, 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 I think about this passage almost every day. Um, so he writes, this is in the editorial notes for November 1987. And the editor <laughs> writes in the third person. Um, 
Not that he has ever been much impressed by cries about the importance of the classics to the Western cultural tradition. It has indeed been important, even seminal, an adjective that I uh, do not use now this. But a culture does not need, perhaps does not even have a moral obligation to be continuously aware of the past that has made it what it is. And there have been times in the past when such awareness may have been a positive handicap to survival and adaptation, as may indeed, as it is clearly believed by some who are in a position to do something about it, be the case now. Let us, who are committed to the classics, keep them alive as best we can. If our pearls are real, as Gilbert Murray once questioned, to answer, of course, that they were, they will survive and people will continue to want them. Now for the clincher part of this passage. We get some ancient Greek. Ede me, dinosaur. But if not, and then he just prints a dinosaur image on the page, right? Ede me, dinosaur. If not, let it go the way of the dinosaur, right? I have conflicting feelings about this passage um, for a couple of reasons. So first of all, I disagree with some of its implicit claims um, and some of its more explicit ones too. So like, I, I don't believe, for instance, that um, the Greco-Roman past is, is the, the only or even the primary um, constitutive element of the past that has made our culture what it is, to, to paraphrase it. And I don't believe uh, that there is a cleanly defined us who are committed to classics who exist in some kind of counterpoint or tension against the, the, the hordes out there who are seeking to ignore it or whatever. Like I, like I think this like sort of reifies like an imminent elitist logic about classics, okay? But I rather like the, 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 the fact that, that, that Pinsent, the editor, is willing to entertain the discipline's death, right? So in the winter, I mean, it's like slated to come out in November, but it may not come out till December. Uh, there will appear an edited volume uh, by uh, Madhura Umachandran uh, and Marcella Ward um, entitled Critical Ancient World Studies, The Case for Forgetting Classics. And the arguments of this volume, to which I contributed an afterword in which I said, oh, this volume is great, all the contributions are great, the editors are great, everyone's great, um, is that we can, can cultivate and sustain relationships to a broad spectrum of antiquities and of ancient societies without doing classics, right? So like, there may actually be, and I, I, I truly do believe that there is, a compelling political, ethical, and also epistemic reason for developing a type of ancient studies that extends well beyond the Greco-Roman Mediterranean, right? But, and now this gets us to a, a context for the words that I quoted from the Liverpool Classical Monthly that is also an operative context for us now, right? When was Pinsent writing this? Pinsent was writing in Thatcherite, in the Thatcherite UK, right? When there were like real slashes to higher ed. Uh, this has continued, right? Anytime an argument is made um, about the desirability or um, amenability um, of coming together in this sort of pan-humanistic way that I imagine, where you know, we in fact bring together all these people who work on ancient studies and like we build towards like a much more vibrant future. It becomes all too easy for, uh, how should I, what should I call them? Uh, capitalist bean, co uh, uh, bean counters to say, uh, yeah, okay, we're just gonna collapse all of your departments. Like you will like all be in one department doing like one thing, right? So this, this, this vision that I have has to be developed like very carefully. Like, right, like you need a politics that simultaneously argues for an emancipatory vision of the ancient world and also says, actually, we need specialists in all of these different fields, right? We need people who can read Sumerian and Akkadian. We need people who like develop uh, and, and master the study um, of Central African and, and, and West African cultures or who like do things, um, I was like immersed in this research a few weeks ago, this is why it's on my mind, um, studying trends in metallurgy uh, in Central and South Africa. Like I mean, like, we need all of these specialists, right? Like our, our tapestry of the ancient past and of ancient past in the plural is impossible to realize in vivid technicolor without all of these specialists. But that requires actual political will to do, right? So that, that's what I would want. I would want a, 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 a 
dramatic retooling of the study of antiquity that proceeds from the assumption that there is a politics at stake in imagining a fuller and more capacious ancient world, and that that politics has to be realized in, in like the here and now. So you've talked a lot about sort of the revisiting of the classics and everything like that and what, how would we use them. So how would you recommend that on an individual level as students, as scholars, how do we sort of go about ensuring that we're contributing to a society where this, the future that you, you uh, propose, where we are broadening our antiquities, incorporating these uh, cultures that have not been incorporated into the classics, how do you recommend that we assist in doing that, and what what could we do? Invest the most malleable thing, which is your time. Uh, so this investment, as I see it, follows several different tracks. Um, for one of them, I'm going to make use of a passage that I, I, I spend much time contemplating um, and some time in a, in, ineffectively teaching. Um, so. I have a love-hate relationship with Aristotle. Um, I, I, I have, uh, the relationship of hate um, is predicated on, premised on really book one of the politics. Um, but there are, there are other things elsewhere in Aristotle that have been um, meaningful to me over the years. Um, the discussion of friendship in the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, but for now, I'm gonna turn to another part of the politics, and this is politics book eight. In politics book eight, Aristotle outlines what he sees as the formative elements of an education fit for the citizen. And after some preliminary remarks on why it is important that the polity maintain an active interest in developing and, and actually clarifying its expectations for the education of its young, he then turns to topics that are non-instrumentalizable in nature, right? And he says, there are certain things that we teach not because they are suitable to a job or a vocation, but because they are suited to the lives of free citizens, right? And so to this end, he develops this like very long, but at points quite exhilarating discussion of like the meaningfulness of music education. He's like really, really interested in music, right? One of the reasons he fastens onto this is because he believes uh, that there are activities that we have to undertake in the exercise of our leisure that, that make us better suited to the practice of what elsewhere in both the politics and in the Nicomachean ethics and in the Eudamian ethics he uh, will um, characterize as the, as the life of blessed contemplation. Right? It's a great thing to be in blessed contemplation with your friends, you know. And it has to be with friends, right? Like, I mean, one can do this by, on one's own, but Aristotle's like very interested in the fact that this kind of contemplation occurs communally. All right. Why is this at all relevant to any discussion um, of what people should be doing in the here and now? It's relevant for two reasons. The first is that Aristotle uh, unwittingly, I think, um, develops a theory of leisure that actually exposes the extent to which leisure is quite dependent on the exploitation of others. Right? So uh, when laying out his justification for the study of music, he, he cites Homer. Um, and he imagines the bard coming to regale everyone, and he quotes um, a passage from uh, the appearance of one of the bards in the Odyssey, right? What is, of course, left unstated um, is that this bard appears to sing and does sing under conditions of compulsion, right? He's not entirely free. And for the delectation of those people who are in that space, his performance is a performance that is simultaneously edifying for them. It's quite entertaining. It's also, in the case of one of the listeners, really traumatic, as Odysseus in disguise begins crying hysterically, right? But it also reaffirms for them the necessity of a kind of exploitation that justifies their education at the expense of other people's capacity to enjoy leisure. And this is actually a really, really important point, because the first time I encountered Aristotle's politics and read this section, uh, of book eight, I thought to myself, wow, my mom never had any leisure, ever. My mom worked her entire life. And until we left for college, I cannot recall a single day that she took off, right? And she would say, oh, you know, this was a sacrifice that was worth it. I did this all for you, right? 
But what about her prospects of participation in the life of blessed contemplation? Right? What, what, what would be needed to ensure that her life and the lives of many, many people are actually full of the same possibilities for blessed contemplation that were made available to me as I went off to my undergrad experience and walked around campus reading short stories and things like that. Right? I think that the life of blessed contemplation has value. And I believe that like, it is imperative for each of us to commit to that. But I'm going to revert now to something I said earlier, which is that you have to, I think, commit to a politics that seeks to open up that life of contemplation to everyone. Right? And I see this as like, the most rewarding commitment that one can undertake as an undergrad, to pursue simultaneously that life of blessed contemplation in community with others, and also strive for a world in which that blessed contemplation is open to every single person. Right? But in order to do this, you actually have to invest in a vision of a future that is radically redistributive. Because like, how is this life of leisure made possible? It is made possible through the accumulation of the resources necessary to fund it. So here again I say, commit to a politics that makes this happen. All right? There is one other thing I'll say, though. It'll be shorter. I mean, this is going to sound carping and perhaps a bit um, bizarre. Um, I think we have to read more, like all of us. But like, I, like I'm saying, like read more in like the sense of practicing the discipline of reading as like a, as a central element of our formation, right? And to that end, I think it's important to read as widely as possible, right? And if we are to read as widely as possible then we need to have the training that enables us to read across different languages, lest we fall into the trap of reaffirming the, the, the monoglot anglophony, anglophony that characterizes much of this existence in, in the US and beyond. So that comes with another political commitment. We have to be willing to agitate for the teaching of languages and literatures as a cornerstone element of our formation and training. Right? So if we're thinking of like an abstract summons to the politics of the kind that I mentioned earlier, and we want to like make it as like nitty grittily concrete as possible, then the one abiding exhortation I would encourage everyone to leave this room with is that you must all go out in the streets and talk about how important the teaching of languages and literatures are. Mm -hmm. right? So. <laughs> so get out in those streets. That is all the time we have. This concludes tonight's presentation. Please join me in thanking Professor Janelle Padilla Peralta.